For those of you who may not know the criteria for induction into the Smith Hall of Fame, I thought I'd read it here for you. The Hall of Fame will recognize individuals living or deceased for personal achievements and contributions, including but not limited to service to or support of the Smith Jesuit. Major contributions to DeSmet Jesuit through personal time and effort, demonstration of the highest principles of integrity and honesty in keeping with the philosophy of DeSmet Jesuit, men for others, and bringing recognition and prominence to DeSmet Jesuit and themselves through their profession and through academics or athletic accomplishments, community service, or achievements in arts and sciences. We can check all of those boxes. Tim certainly meets and exceeds the criteria for induction. He has given generously of his time, his treasure, his talent for the benefit of his Smith Jesuit and many other organizations. Tim was a member of the class of 1976. Upon graduation, Tim went on to St. Louis University. He graduated in 1980. Bachelor of Arts, Psychology, with a business certificate. Then on to St. Louis University School of Law, where he graduated in 1983 with his Juris Doctorate. Upon graduation from law school, Tim began his professional career as an associate with the Devereux Law Firm from 1983 to 1987. In 1987, he joined Biomedical Systems as Vice President, Corporate Development, General Counsel from 1987 to 1998, then as Chief Executive Officer from 1998 to present. Biomedical Systems is a privately held global healthcare company with over 400 employees, headquartered here in St. Louis with offices in Europe, India, China, and Japan. Currently, Tim is a member of the Missouri Bar, a member of the Smed Jesuit Finance Committee, member of the Triad Bank Board of Directors, and also a member of the Lillian Oak Hill Board of Trustees. For those of you who know Tim Barrett, I don't think I'm going to tell you anything that you don't already know. But I do think I will affirm that which you do know about. To illustrate my point, I reached out to a few classmates and friends of Tim's, along with some past and still present faculty. I told him that Tim was being inducted into the Smet Jesuit Hall of Fame, and I was given the honor of introducing him. So, I asked him to tell me what comes to mind when I say Tim Bear. And here's what they had to say. Deserving. Nice guy. Someone you can count on that will always be there for you. Famous for his smile. I like that one. Sincere. He's the same today as he was 40 years ago. Courteous, thoughtful, a genuinely good guy. Soft-spoken, always willing to help out and get involved. Somebody you want to name. A sense of humor, generous, and I love this next one, gregarious. <laughs> this is one from his classmate attributed to Gene Smith's class in the book, 30 Days of More Powerful Vocabulary. But thank you, Nick Lamb, for that one. While I couldn't agree more with each of these sentiments, it's these final three that most resonate for me as I see Tim and his induction into the Smith Jesuit Hall of Fame. Tim is Mr. Smith. He models men for others. He epitomizes the grad grad. Frankly, Tim exemplifies the graduate and graduation before we had it, and that dates back to 1981. It's what we want for each of our graduates. And for those of you who don't know, our seniors conclude their year with in sickness, if you will, a capstone project, which requires them to reflect upon their time at the Jesuit through the lens of six characteristics of the grad grad. I believe Tim embodies, and frankly lives, each of these six characteristics of the graduate at the time of graduation, which are open to growth, intellectually competent, religious, loving, committed to justice, and developing as a leader. 
finally. Suffice to say, we, to spend judgment, are proud of graduates like Tim Barrett. I hope that we, to spend judgment, in turn, make him proud of us. It's my pleasure and honor to present to you the Smed Jesuit class of 1976 and the 35th inductee member of the Smed Jesuit Hall of Fame, Mr. Tim Barrett. tell you, I have not been so happy in this gym since that day in 1976 when I scored the winning basket. <laughs> <laughs> now that was an inner real game, so <laughs> take it with a great song. So the first order of business tonight <clears throat> is to congratulate uh, Greg Vitello and Tom Sontra on the well deserved honor. Greg Vitello literally gave, I guess, his entire adult life to the school and in service to the school. And that's a simple statement, but it says a lot about it. And Tom, back when the school was quite young, and maybe not quite on the map, as an all-state football player, you and your teammates brought so much positive attention to the school. And then since then, of course, you've continued to support it so greatly. So congratulations to both of you guys. The second order of business, of course, is to send out a bunch of thank yous. And until Andy mentioned the names of the uh, committee, before that, I had no idea who the committee was comprised of. And of course, I understand that their job is to look at you know, the different people and deliberate on who should be uh, nominated and whatnot. And I think they're supposed to reach out. I understand they did reach out to other people who uh, spoke on my behalf, I suppose. So I don't know who those other people were. I have some suspicions, but I don't know. And until tonight, I didn't know who was on the committee. But to the people who spoke on my behalf, um, all I can say, of course, is thank you. I swear I don't know what you said. <laughs> you apparently walked a fine line between wild exaggeration and outright lying. <laughs> but it worked. Here I am. So that's awesome. And then to the committee. Uh, again, I did not know anybody except for one guy, of course, the guy who gave me the call to let me know the news. And that was, uh, since Andy already mentioned the names, uh, this was Jim Buck. And it was really neat on a couple uh, levels. Jim is a contemporary of my sons, Matt and Mark. Uh, they are buddies from back here in their days here when they were all in the lacrosse program. So um, it was great to hear from him, not just because of the news he was delivering, but to know that there's young alums out there who continue to to give back to the school, to devote their time and energy, and uh, that that's just great. I, I'm so happy that he's uh, doing that. So, uh, so anyway, the uh, uh, the nice uh, quick side story though to make a point is that when Jim tried to call me the first time, Margaret and I were out to dinner. And I missed the call, so it turned out it wasn't until the next day uh, when uh, we connected by phone. And. Uh, uh, I was at the office though, and so uh, when Jim called, if I had been with Margaret instead, as soon as I found out why he was calling, I would immediately hand the phone to her because Margaret, like so many others, including many of my classmates, are much more deserving than me of this. Who else in the right mind co-chairs the office not once but twice? <laughs> So I don't watch many of those shows on TV, the, those award shows, but I know that when people are going on too long, they have a little guy at the side who starts playing the piano kind of gently to let you know that your time is up. And so, so my problem is my hearing is not what it used to be. So does anybody hear any piano music? <laughs> okay, well, that was your chance. So, uh, so let me move on. The, uh, as I understand it, it's, it's customary and appropriate that uh, I should offer a few words about what Smed has meant to me, or maybe a story about what the Smed has done for me. So on the one hand, that's about as easy as can be, an easy task, because there's so many stories to choose from. But that's actually why it makes it so hard, because there's so many, so how do you choose just one? You know, When I think about what the Smed has given me, the first thing I think about are the friends I made here. And I'm not talking about just only my class, a bunch of great guys, 
but by extension, the guys a little older, a little younger, who, uh, who we overlap with. You know, we've been friends for 30 plus years. Uh, if God willing, if we're lucky, it'll be 30 plus more. So, um, so I could tell stories all night long about those guys. I could also go down the route of uh, when I had the privilege of serving on the board of trustees here. It was really, I, I swear, I don't know what I contributed, but I do know what I learned. I learned so much from seeing the administrators of this school. Uh, you know, there's inherent natural things that always come up. I got to see how they reacted, what, you know, what their strategies were. And I got to rub shoulders with the other members of the Board of Trustees. And, you know, they all came from diverse businesses and backgrounds and industries. And all these things I could kind of soak in and take back to my family as we do our best to run, uh, you know, our family business. And of course, I could always go down the route of talking about when uh, the pride and satisfaction I had in seeing my own sons uh, go to the cement. Um, you know, they uh, you know they experienced a lot of the same things we all did, uh, us old guys, uh, just like us. They entered as kids and they exited as uh, young adults. Um, and then, being involved with the lacrosse program, I also got the uh, maybe closer opportunity than most to see the uh, mentor. Uh, see the mentor that they had and the uh, role model they had in another uh, member of this Hall of Fame, Mike Seth. So with all those uh, possibilities, I finally came to the conclusion, no, let's tell a story. If it's got to be just one story. Let's tell a story about the teachers here at this school because what, what is the heart and soul of any school but the teachers? And, and even with that, there's so many choices. Um, you know, for instance, I, I had, well, first of all, I had so many great teachers here, three of whom, not coincidentally, I guess, are, are in this Hall of Fame. Uh, Rich Grower, who was always so analytical, and Chris Mess, who is here, and uh, Chris always made class interesting. And, uh, and of course, uh, the most enthusiastic teacher I probably ever had, and that was the late Bob Christian. But, to, uh, but the story I'm going to tell has got a little bit of a practical component to it. And to properly set it up, I actually have to flash forward a little bit to the days after the SMAT, after graduating. The, uh, at that time, there was a ton of classmates and I. We were, you know, kind of uh, rebels. We, you know, had a kind of pioneer spirit. And uh, we went ahead and made a big commitment to travel all the way to St. Louis U for college. And uh, <laughs> mom and dad probably would not have been thrilled at the time to know that I was entering the seven-year program there in school. But that's not as bad as it sounds because it did include law school. <laughs> and I know we have a lot of lawyers here. Um, and I think they would all agree with me that the most single important ability a student can bring to law school is their writing skills. And the reason for that is that, uh, and I know we have a lot of lawyers, I hope they agree. Uh, the reason for that, the way it's structured, is that every single grade with a few exceptions that you receive in law school is based on how you do on one single final written exam there's there's no quizzes there's no tests no midterms no extra credit the tests are not multiple choice or true false you've got one chance and one chance only every december every may you show up to some classroom you sit down they hand you some questions and for the next three or four hours you just start to write and the law professors are very upfront. They're, they're very transparent. They let you know that even if you know the subject matter, inside out, upside down, and all around, but you can't get those ideas down on paper in a well-written, logical way, you're behind the exam. And on the other hand, and this is what applied to me, even if you didn't know the subject matter, inside out, upside down, all around, but you could you can get it written in a very organized way, well-written way. You know, you're gonna you're gonna do fine. You're gonna get by. You know, C plus for me, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so now back to my days here at Smet, and amongst the many great teachers I had, uh, and it's so funny that, that her name was mentioned already. Junior year, my English teacher was Mrs. Jean Smith, and as all of you, as many of you know, who've been here for quite a while. Uh, Mrs. Smith, just like Mike Sennett, was uh, lost her life at a very young age. And in senior year, I had a, a young teacher. It was his very first year here at the SMEC, and his name uh, was Mr. Carl Bowen. Now, um, it's amazing because Mark and Matt, when they were here, they knew him as Mr. Carl Evelyn. And it, it called to mind a, a catchphrase that he had 
uh, here at DeSmet, we would be talking about some piece of literature, some novel, and trying to figure out what did the artist, or excuse me, what did the uh, author mean to say here? What was his message? Was it this or was it that? Was it that or was it this? And he would kind of sum things up finally by saying, you know, somehow it's both. And so when it comes to pronunciation's name, I guess somehow it could be both. <laughs> so what made these two teachers so great? Um, well, first of all, I can tell you that neither one was the fire and brimstone type. You know, Mrs. Smith, as I recall, was quite soft-spoken. And uh, Mr. Evola was actually kind of borderline shy. Um, so it wasn't anything along those lines. And I know there's many professional educators out there, and if they were, could go see our classes back in the day, they could probably identify you know, what skills they had, what techniques, what style. Uh, but of course, that all went over my head. But the one thing I could tell you that even a, a young guy sitting in the classroom noticed is that they were always prepared. When they came to that classroom, they were ready to go. And that kind of rubbed, out, rubbed off on us. We knew that if we wanted to be in this class, we had to be ready to go too. You could almost picture an analogy would be a, a train whistle. When the train whistle goes off, you better be on board the train or, because it's going to leave the station with or without you. And somehow these two had uh, an ability to get their students on the train and get them enthused and get them prepared. So I wish I could be more eloquent. I wish I could say it better. But the simple fact is, you know, they taught and we all learned. It was as simple as that. So the postscript to the story, and, and many of you probably have guessed, but it turns out uh, these two classes, the classes junior to senior that uh, Mrs. Smith and Mr. Evola taught, they were part of the 1818 program here at Tisbet. And that's the program in conjunction with SLU where if you take the classes here, they count as uh, college credit at SLU. So well, on that very first day of freshman year at St. Louis U, when I went to my first class, I don't remember what it was, but I can tell you it was not an English class because on that very first day, I already had all the English credits that I needed to graduate from school. So I never took a single English class there. So whatever it was that allowed me to get into law school, to get through law school, to pass the bar exam, whatever that was, you can trace it all the way right back to this school, to those educators. Um, it was truly a gift that I received from all of them, and particularly Mrs. Smith and Mr. Evola. For them, to them, I will always be grateful. If this was an award show, I'd have a guy standing right next to me playing the bugle. <laughs> but I've got the microphones here, I'm going to do one more thing. I've got this friend, remember I talked about my friends, uh, one of my oldest friends that I met here at DeSmet. He's a fascinating guy, he was a leader here at the school. He deserves some recognition, he's kind of a needy guy in that way. Uh, like I said, a crazy background, crazy career. Um, Giving, he's always given back to the cement. His sons have gone here. And uh, he's the guy who created and donated every one of the uh, portraits that you see of the Hall of Fame members. And so as I take my seat, uh, I'd appreciate if you recognize my friend, Rod Dreyer.